All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's do something real quick just before I forget. And Shannon, can you do this when you have a minute? Uh, put on the end of the text questions a reminder that anyone on the Honduras team that's helping with outdoor outreach, if you guys could chat with me um, just right after we finish for a few minutes, I want to um, let you in on a couple ideas that we have and see if schedule-wise it could work. So um, Honduras team that, that will be available the week of outdoor outreach. So I'm thinking Austin, Carson, Taylor, Grace and Lydia, um, Marissa, Lauren. Who else is going to be at both? Rachel. Rachel already told me no. But, um, but anyone who's going to be a part of that, please, uh, I'd love to chat with you for just a couple minutes at the end. Okay. Um, as a youth group, we're doing a series right now on spiritual disciplines. Uh, the things that God has given for us to do that will help us to grow in our, in our Christ-likeness. And they're, they're things like Bible reading and prayer and solitude and, and fasting and serving. And there's, there's a ton of them, and we've covered so many so far. But tonight we're going to talk about one that's kind of, um, it's interesting. It's, it's the uh, discipline of stewardship. Or management is another way. But the Bible calls it stewardship, meaning God gives us responsibility. He goes, hey, dude, this is for you, and uh, I need you to take care of it. And the way that you handle that and manage that, it can either be an instrument that God uses to help you become more Christ-like, or you can mismanage it, and it, it can be a wasted opportunity. And so we're going to talk about that tonight, but let's go ahead and pray first, and, uh, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you so much for spiritual disciplines. Thank you for giving us things that we can do that uh, you have, really, you've, you've commissioned, you've put into uh, effect to be, to be things that'll help us grow. And God, we, again, we just want to keep saying this and keep uh, praying this. We, we know that, you know, they're not, they're not things that we check off of a list to make us better Christians. They're not things that, that earn us uh, our relationship with you, but they are instruments that you use to help us know you better. And so, God, that's how we want to use them. Uh, not, you know, not doing it out of guilt or shame or anything else, but because we see it as an opportunity for us to know you better. And so, Lord, as we think about management, stewardship, God, help us to be people who handle the responsibilities that you've given to us. Handle those well. And so, Lord, please be with us tonight as we open up your word together, and we pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. So go ahead and grab a Bible and pop it open to page number one uh, to the book of Genesis. And I want to show you that early on, God puts into play this idea of stewardship, and he does it right away. He's, uh, you guys that are familiar with the Bible, you know that it starts out with God creating, that he's a creator God, and he's speaking things into existence when he says, let there be, and he says whatever that next thing is going to be, it, it comes into existence. He, he's that kind of God, that he's powerful and sovereign, and, and he's a communicating God, and when he communicates, things happen. And so he's speaking, and uh, we actually get to uh, verse 26, and we see that, that God is going to make mankind. And this is how it goes, if you guys are with me. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So right away, God is saying, I'm going to make mankind, and, and mankind is special, in, in, in the sense that mankind is made in the image of God, that there is something unique about humanity that, um, th that's different than, than all the rest of creation. Um, God is going to say, this is my special creation. We are the crown of creation. But, he, but as he's describing even the purpose for making mankind in his image, it's, it's for this idea of management. It's this idea of stewardship. He's going to make mankind in his image so that they might rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, um, all of the livestock that, that are on the earth. It's, it's, God is saying, I'm going to make man and I'm going to commission them to be on my team. It's kind of crazy, right? God is owner God of creation. He's the one who made it all. We're all accountable to him. But then he goes, but I want to make you co-managers with me. He's going to make mankind and he's going to give them responsibility. And that's just part of, of, of who we are as people. God made us and then he makes us responsible people. He makes us, he gifts us, and then he gives us a task. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his, in his own image and the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. 
rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so you see it here. You see in Genesis 1 that God is making man and woman and he's giving them responsibility. He's, he's giving them this concept of stewardship. You are going to be placed into the creation that I've made and you are going to be responsible over it. And that keeps going on. I mean, it's not unique to them. That's just how humanity is. We are people who have been gifted with, with um, you know, having the image of God, but we are tasks. Uh, we are given the task of, of actually co-laboring with him and managing that which he has made. Does that make sense? And so this idea of stewardship starts off on page one. You know, God makes us and he says, you've got a job to do and it's rulership. We get a little bit more detail when we look at chapter 2, verse 15. Um, if you look with me, it says, The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And then he gives them some, some more commands. But he's saying, okay, bro, here's your territory. This, I'm putting you here in my garden, but you have a responsibility to care for it and to keep it. Okay? And so this idea started way back then, and it continues on. It is the idea that God makes you very purposefully. He gifts you with the image of him in you, but he does it so that you would take responsibility and ownership and that you would be a co-manager with him over the things that he's given to you, okay? So when we talk about this tonight, we're saying God has given each of us a responsibility, and, and we have a choice of how we're going to handle that responsibility. We have to des decide whether we're going to manage things in a way that's pleasing to God or not by, by mismanaging or, or by using it for our own ends or for our own gains. And so let's go ahead and look at a case study now. I want to show you uh, how this looks in real time. So turn with me to Genesis 39, and we're going to look at the story of Joseph. So it's actually uh, just a few pages away. It's on um, page 29 in our Bibles. And I want to show you how this plays out. Now, as I talk about God giving you responsibility, some might say, I don't have a lot that I'm responsible for. You know, I live with my parents. Uh, I don't make any money. I don't, you know, you might come up with a list of, I'm not really that responsible because I don't have that much responsibility over stuff. And so this idea core is going to be kind of hard for me to apply. And I want to show you that it doesn't just boil down to, you know, categories like money. Or, or, or things like that, that it actually extends beyond um, the narrow categories to God gives you responsibility even if ownership belongs to another individual. Okay, so we'll see it here as we jump in the story. Uh, Joseph, he was kind of a, a punk, right? He, he, was, a little, he was a kid uh, in a big family uh, like the Morrises or the Reeds, and, and he had all these different brothers, uh, all these different siblings, and he has a dream, and he's the second youngest, okay? So he's one of the little dudes. He has a dream where all of his siblings and his parents bow down to him. I don't, I don't know if you have siblings, but if they told you that was their dream about you and your, your family, you'd probably have a similar response. They're like, we don't like you right? We don't like you, Joseph. And they start to harbor this, this grudge against him, and actually they start to uh, devise a way to get rid of him. And so they're, they're out and about. All of the siblings are hanging out together, and they're like, let's, let's get rid of this dude. They throw Joseph into a pit, and uh, they're coming up with a game plan of what they're going, going to do with him. They end up selling him into slavery, and then taking Joseph's jacket and bringing it back to dad with blood on it and going, I think he got eaten by a bear, you know, or I think he got torn apart uh, by a wild animal. And so they sell him into slavery. They, they lie about it, but they sell him into slavery. And then we pick up the story in Genesis 39 where we begin to see how God continues to deal with, with Joseph. And it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So Joseph, being sold into slavery, gets purchased uh, by this group, and he ends up in a setting where he is in Potiphar's home. Potiphar purchases him. He's a wealthy man. He's got a lot of responsibility. And, and as the story goes on, it says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of, of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and, be, in, and uh, became his servant, his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. 
From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So Joseph, even though he's been sold into slavery, he's getting responsibility, right? He's, he's Potiphar's attendant, and everything in Potiphar's home is placed under Joseph's care. Now, Joseph is practicing what, what we're talking about tonight. He's taking the responsibility that's been given to him, and he's using it wisely. He's using it in a way that's pleasing to God, and, and he's experiencing blessing and favor, and, and Pharaoh's, uh, Potiphar's noticing, right? Potiphar's like, dude, this guy has the hand of God on him, and everything I give him just touches, you know, it turns to gold. And, uh, and so he just keeps entrusting him with more and more care, and he's like, I don't even worry about it. I don't even concern myself with anything that this man is responsible for because he's doing things in, in a pleasing way, right? So he gets this concept. Joseph... Is, is cultivating this lifestyle of stewardship where he's taking care of things and he's doing it in an honorable and pleasing way to the Lord. And, and there's results, uh, you know, as a, as a result of that. Um, he's experiencing the favor of God. So um, he gets entrusted with this care, but it doesn't go well, right? The, the wife I don't know if you guys are familiar with this story. The wife starts to look at him. He's a handsome dude. Uh, he's obviously, you know, talented at the things that he's doing. And so she starts to make advances on him. But he's, he, look at how he responds. He's like, N no, this is crazy. Okay, you're being a crazy chick. Uh, the master has put everything in my care. He doesn't concern himself with anything. The only thing he's withheld from me is you, his wife. Now, how could I do this to my master. And then he, he takes it another step. How could I do this to God? Right? He's managing what has been placed under his care with a recognition that it ultimately matters how God feels about it. And he's going, I am not going to do that. But she's persistent and she keeps going after him and making these advances. And one day everyone's kind of out of the house and she makes an advance on him and he's like, no. And he runs away, but she grabs his jacket and he leaves with, with his jacket in her hand right? He's, gonna, he's doing the right thing. He's, he's, he's managing well, and he's even unwilling to step into this uh, situation in a sinful way. And, and so she accuses him. She's like, look, this servant boy of yours, he's, you know, he was coming on to me, and she accuses him of, of trying to rape her, and he, he ends up going to prison, okay? And so the story is showing us that even if we deal responsibly, that we're, things aren't always going to go well, you know? I can't make that promise to you that if you manage everything that God gives you, that you're just going to always get blessing. Sometimes you have to do what's right regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the change in management, right? If God puts stuff under your care, you do what he wants, even if it's really, really, really hard. And that's what Joseph did. Um, so so he, he actually now is in prison, but the prison guard, the warden, starts to notice that anything that he entrusts to Joseph Joseph stewards manages well. And so he keeps giving Joseph more and more responsibility within the prison. And again, we see this concept playing out in his life where because Joseph is faithfully managing the responsibilities given to him, he keeps getting more and more opportunity to glorify God. The story keeps going on. I mean, it's a long story and there's just kind of these seasons and chapters, but, but a consistent theme throughout is Joseph is willing to, to do what God wants him to do. That he is going to manage whatever's placed under his care in a way that's honorable to God. Uh, he eventually gets set free. He, he eventually actually becomes the second in command of, in all of Egypt under Pharaoh. And, and uh, with God's help, I mean, actually it's God's doing, he hatches a plan for how he's going to save thousands of people. And he does it. But the theme throughout is his willingness to take what is under his care and to handle it in a way that's pleasing to God. And so when you begin to think through, well, I don't know if I've got a lot of responsibility. You do. And I'll show you in a few minutes. But, but whatever is under your care, even if it belongs to somebody else, it matters how you handle it. It matters how you steward it. Even if your parents are going, I need you to do these things. And you're going, well, that doesn't really benefit me. That doesn't, that's not a good excuse. Because God is going, if you have that responsibility and that ability, you need to handle the stuff under your care in a way that's pleasing to him. 
And so that's what we're talking about. And, uh, and, and it's a heavy calling. God has given each of us some different responsibilities, and we need to start to try to be more like Joseph, who is willing to do the right thing regardless of the circumstances. Um, and so I hope you'll, you'll join me in that. But let me show you uh, another motivation for why we should do this. Turn with me to Matthew 25. We looked at this last week. It's on page 694. Um, so we looked at a case study of Joseph. We looked at how he handled stuff. But I, I want to point something out to you that I, that I think could be very motivating towards your pursuit of the spiritual discipline of managing God's resources. And, and the story in Matthew 25, the context is uh, the disciples are asking Jesus, um, how are we going to know when it's the end? How are we going to know when the kingdom has come? And so Jesus launches into a bunch of teachings about um, the coming kingdom and, and how they're going to experience that. And then in Matthew 25, <clears throat> actually verse 14 and following, he, he begins into this parable that we talked about last week, and it, and it really sheds some light on management and stewardship. It says in verse 14, it'll, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Sound familiar? I mean, that's Genesis 1 stuff. That's, that's God going, here, Adam, here's your responsibility. Uh, I'm going to go away, but I'm entrusting this to your care, so, so look after it. Care for it and keep it. It's Joseph language, right? It's Potiphar's going, you're my attendant. I've got all this responsibility, all this wealth. It's all under your care. So, so handle it in a way that's, that's appropriate. Here we are again. Jesus is saying there's a man who went on a journey. He had great wealth, and so he entrusted it to some servants. And this is what it looked like. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Okay, so let's stop right there. First thing I want you to see is that God gives you responsibility uh, in a way that he feels is appropriate, according to your ability. So he's going to give you some different things that are going to be under your care, and he does it very purposefully, you know? Um, so it means, on the one hand, we can't say, oh, I don't, I'm not equipped to do that. Because if God put it under your care, then he's given you everything you need to handle it. Does that make sense? You can't go, oh, I don't think that that's for me because, you know, I, don't, I just don't have that confidence. If God gives you responsibility, you can, you can bet that he's also going to equip you to handle that well. Now, it might be very hard, uh, but I think that that's true. He gives each according to his ability. It also means that you can't look at somebody with the five and go, man, I should have gotten that, right? If you recognize that God sovereignly gives us what, what he feels is appropriate, that, that can be freeing for you. That you just go, okay, God gave me this. Big or small, this is appropriate for my ability, so here's my responsibility. I'm going to handle it well. Okay? He's given me a task. He's given me a responsibility, big or small, but he knows what's best, and he knows me, and he knows my ability, and so I'm going to take what he's given me, and I'm going to handle it in a way that's pleasing to him. So that'll hopefully prevent us from getting jealous or envious or looking at other people, and we just go, you know what? This is for me. This is my assignment, so I'm going to handle it for God. So he gives each according to their ability. Then he went on his journey. Verse 16, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Okay, so two of the guys get to work. They take what they've received and they invest it. And they put it to work, and there's a return on investment. But the one dude, in fear, he buries, a, you know, he t digs a hole and buries it. And it goes on. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. This is what I want you to see. And this is what I want to motivate you with. God is going to settle all accounts, right? He's going to gift all of us with different responsibilities. But there's a day where we're going to stand accountable for what he's given to us. And we're going to have to give an account. The Bible talks about how we'll give an account for every idle word, for every deed, for all these different things, but, but definitely for the responsibilities that he's given to us and how we handled them, how we managed them. And so he's going to return to settle accounts just like he does here. Verse 28, I'm sorry, verse 20. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge with many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Here's another point. There, God expects a return on investment. He gives you responsibility. He gives you something to manage. And he doesn't w- want you to just squander it. He wants a return on investment. He's going, I'm giving you this. I'm giving you this talent. I'm giving you this skill. I'm giving you this experience. And what I want you to do is to take that and, and make something of it. Glorify God with it. He, he's looking for a return on investment, and he rewards those who are faithful. The one who took five, got five more, he goes, that's awesome, right? Come and share in my happiness. Experience the reward of your faithfulness. There's a reward for handling what God has given to you in a way that's pleasing to him. Same thing with the second dude. Um, Verse 22, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Same, same scenario. Return on investment is what God is looking for. Verse 24, then the man who had received the one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew I harvested where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that, I could, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. Then whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Super harsh story, right? But the principles are very important for us to hear. That God gives us different responsibilities, and and he expects a return on investment. And there's a day of accounting where he's going to ask us, how'd you do with that? I gave you all these different opportunities. I gave you all of these different investments. What did you do with it? And and for many of us, I hope that we get to experience that reward and that happiness of God. And God, you you placed me here. You've given me this. I put it to work and and, and I I brought you glory to the best of my ability by your help. And and, uh, and he's going to go, that's great. But to some of us, we need that kick in the pants, which is exactly what Matthew 25 is designed to do. Go, what are you doing? You know, I've given you this. I don't care how, how much of a fraidy cat you are. I expect for you to take what I've given you. I've given it to you according to your ability. I know what, what, what you could do with this. I know the potential, but are you going to handle it in a way that I want you to handle it? Don't just stuff it. Don't just bury it, but put it to work. And, and, and some of us need to hear that and go, okay, God wants me to be more intentional with the things that he's given to me. And so... I think if we, if we consider that, it'll motivate us to be more like Joseph. That one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account. So let me just suggest a few different things that God has given to each of us. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can manage those things well. Number one, God gives all of us in here time. That is a commodity that he gives to each of us. And, and we need to learn how to manage time in a way that glorifies God. Let me give you a few different ideas about time uh, from scripture. Number one, we should make the most out of time. We should make the most out of every opportunity. This is Ephesians 5 verses 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So Paul is writing to the Ephesian church and he's going, guys, live wisely. Take every opportunity that you have. Take every moment that you can and, and use it in a way that's pleasing to God and recognize this, that the days are evil, that there's tremendous potential for us to squander what God, has, what God has given us with our time in ways that are definitely not pleasing to him. So take those moments captive and put them to work for God. Are you using your time that, that intentionally? Are you living wisely and saying, you know what? I've got a limited amount of time uh, this side of the eternity, you know, and I'm going to use it for God's glory. I'm going to invest it well. I'm going to spend it on him and his glory. So, so take every opportunity to glorify God. Number two, time is short. 
Even if you lived 120 years, okay, you're one of those freaks that like very healthy and you just live and live and live. Even if you did that, 120 years is nothing compared to eternity. The Bible says that over and over and over again. In the book of James, it talks about how our life is a mist. That it's like, you know, it's like the fog in the morning and it's here for a moment and then it's gone. That, it, that it's like a vapor. That is like a shadow. That it's just, it's, it's so brief. And so you've got a limited amount of time, even if it's 120 years, it's a short amount of time. And so use it wisely. Recognize that you should be investing every one of those years, every one of those days in ways that are pleasing to God because time is short. Number three, time is useful. I mean, put your time to work for you. That's what we're talking about, this discipline of stewardship. We should be taking our schedule and going, okay, how can I maximize this for God's glory? 2 Corinthians 6.2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Time can be useful. Today can be useful for you to grow in your knowledge of God, in your faithfulness to Him, and so put it to work for you. Uh, Richard Baxter, he talks about it this way, contemplating this idea of the usefulness of time and, and even the regret of using it poorly. He says, Think how madly they consumed their lives and wasted the only time that, that was given them to prepare for their salvation. Okay, he's talking about people who have passed away and he's talking about the deep regret. The time that they had, that they wasted, that was given to them for this purpose, this usefulness of preparing them for salvation. And then he goes on. Do, you, do those in hell now think them wise that are idling or playing away their time on earth? You know, he's commenting on, on the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a parable that Jesus told about uh, the destiny of two different individuals and one, the rich man, he experienced all sorts of good things in his earthly life and Lazarus was a poor man who was covered in sores who sat at the, at the gate of the rich man just to get some scraps and, and the, the poor man ends up in heaven, okay, ends up at Abraham's bosom and the rich man ends up in hell. And, and there's this great divide between the two and the rich man is so regretful and he's going, he's going, please just warn my family, you know? Um, somebody just comfort me. And, and, and the point of the story is, is for us to recognize, you know, that what we do on earth really matters in eternity. And that we should use the time that we have now in preparation for our salvation. That we should maximize what God has given to us in a useful way that helps us to know our great salvation. Here's another thing that God gives each of us. Gifts, talents, and abilities. I look around here, we're all very different. Um, we've got different gifts and we've got different talents and we've got different abilities. Some of you are athletic, some of you are not. Okay? Some of you are musical, some of you aren't. Like Some of us aren't. Um, some of you, I mean, we just have this diversity of giftedness in here. Uh, and, and God said, I'm giving you this. This is something that I want you to manage. Your talents and your abilities and your experiences, that's, that's all God saying, here's, here's your assignment. You take what I've given you and you use it. And, and listen to me, every single person in here has that. And some of you might be thinking, you know, thinking along the lines of, I don't know what, I, I don't know what my gift is. And I kind of feel worthless. And I just want you to hear this tonight. And you can look at me. God gives each of you a gift and he gives each of you an assignment and he gives each of you an ability and it might not be the the most sexy thing that any of us have in here but he definitely gives each of us an assignment and so you need to figure out what that is and you need to put it to work in fact Ephesians 2 10 talks about it that you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works God fashioned you he formed you he made you he gifted you and so he wants you to use that and manage that in a way that's pleasing to him. Here's the last, or I guess I got a couple more. Possessions. God gives us possessions that he wants us to care for. Um, you know, your stuff. Uh, if you think about Adam in, in Genesis 2.15, he says, here's your garden. It's my garden, but I'm going to put you, you know, responsible over it. And God does the same thing to us. He goes, here's your stuff. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to manage the stuff that I've given you in a way that's pleasing to me, God would ask. So, so we need to manage our possessions, our, 
our bedrooms, our stuff, all the things that God has placed in our care. We need to be people who are, who are looking after that. And then a, a final one is money, right? I think a lot of times when we talk about stewardship, it deals with money. And, and some of you guys have jobs and some of you have ability to get money. Um, but God wants us to use our money, to manage money in a way that's pleasing to him. The Bible talks about money in a lot of different ways, but it says it's an indication of your heart. Uh, it talks about how where your treasure is, there your heart is, and that's from Matthew 6, 21. But it's saying you usually use your money in a way that reveals your biggest concerns. And so I, I want you to have a heart that is treasuring God, and I want your money to reflect that. I think there's a way that we can manage money that's pleasing to God. Uh, Shannon and I have been talking about in the fall doing a, um, like a financial series where we talk about how to handle money. So we're teaching you guys all some different skills about uh, financial management because I think that that's godly. You know, that if you guys know how to stay out of debt and save money and give generously, that's good. So let me just give you a few different things. A heart that treasures God will spend wisely. When you make purchases, are you managing the money that God has given you? Thinking, does this glorify Him? Spending wisely is a way that we can manage our money. Number two, save carefully. The book of Proverbs talks about the fool who just spends everything. But it's wise to be able to set, you know, to, to set yourself up for the future, not knowing what the days are going to bring. And so people who treasure God, I think, are wise with their money and they save carefully. And then the and another thing that they do is they give generously. If you have resources, are you willing to part ways with it for the good of other people? Are you willing to give to the church as an expression of your worship? But if, you, if your heart really treasures God, then your money's going to flow in those directions. And so um, God has given you all these different things, and he wants us to manage it well. And when we do that, it helps us to grow in our Christ-likeness. Um, so... I hope that all of us in here will consider, okay, God's given us all these different things. Everyone in here has a responsibility. How are we going to use it? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the idea of stewardship. Thank you for gifting us. I mean, I think that's the part of your image in us is the reality that you give us a, a task and you give us responsibility to make decisions that, that can honor you. And so, Lord, I pray that with the things that you've given to each of us, that we would be willing to um, conduct ourselves in a manner that is pleasing to you, where you would be able to respond to each of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's your re reward. I've, you've been faithful with little. I will put you in charge of much. Enter into my happiness. And so, Lord, help each of us to hear that from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's uh, do one question because we're out of time. We'll do one question. We'll pray. And if you guys want to hang out for a few extra minutes, we can. Um, but if you need to get going, that's cool too. And then if the Honduras team would stay, please, then we can chat for a couple more minutes. So how do you know what God is holding you accountable for? That is an awesome question, and you can go wrong in two different directions, okay? Uh, and this is an idea that I got from Paul Tripp. But, but let's say there's a circle of responsibility. And some people have the tendency to shrink their circle. So if you feel like, oh, that's not my problem, you're probably that person, right? <laughs> you're shrinking your responsibility. If you keep on putting it on somebody else, or no, that's God's business. That's my mom's business. That's uh, his business. I don't even know who he is. But that's not mine. Um, you're shrinking it. Some people expand their circle of responsibility to start to infringe on things that they don't really have control over. And those people are typically worried and anxious, and, and they keep on putting things into their circle that they really have no control over, and so they're suffering under that. Uh, I would encourage you to pray through your circle of responsibility. God, what have you given to me? Uh, do I have the ability to do anything about this concern? Okay? And, and what would that look like for me to be faithful to what you've, you know, what you've given to me? And I would also invite you to have other people speak into your life. Okay? Get other Christians, people who could be wise counsel and sounding boards for you, and just run it by them. Hey, I'm wondering if, if, if this is my responsibility or not. What do you think? 
And most time, you know, with the community of faith, like God can help us sort through that better. Uh, the problem is if you try to go it alone and just figure it out by yourself, you have blind spots and, and you have tendencies and you need other people to be able to correct you so you can know, okay, that is my responsibility. Um, but I, I hope that that's helpful. Um, let's pray. I'm sorry we're out of time. I'll pray, and if you need to get going, you can. We'll chill for a couple minutes and maybe do another question or two if you want to hang out. But let's pray. God, thank you so much for um, this youth group and, and the, the ability that we have to get together and to worship you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take the things that we talked about tonight and that you would amplify by your spirit the things that are true to your word. And God, that you would silence the things that, that were off. And so, Lord, help us, God, as we move away from this moment to apply your truth to our lives. Help us to be managers of the things you've given us and to do it in a way that's pleasing to you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. If you need to get going, you can. Should we do any more questions? Okay, let's do it. Is it a sin to steward something poorly? Uh, yes. Okay, that's the simple answer. Um, the, the simple answer is yes, it's a sin. God gives us responsibility, and, um, and, and we sin in all sorts of different ways. We sin uh, by taking something that God has given us and, and uh, you know, not handling it well, and it can look different, you know, like, in the book of James, it talks about how when we fail to do things that we know that we should, that's also sin. Uh, so it's not just like when you perform an act that's sinful that you sin. It's even when you fail to do something that you know you should. And so sometimes God gives us stuff, and the way that we sin, you know, can, there's all sorts of different ways that we can sin with what God has given us. But here's what you need to know. Um, as a believer in Christ, you, you're, you're not going to lose your salvation, I think that that's an important distinction to make because I don't want you to, to leave here going, oh my gosh, like I've got these responsibilities that I've been doing really bad at, so I must not be a real Christian. Because that's not really how it works. But you, you will lose reward. And that's from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that, that you could suffer a loss of, of you know, some of the benefits of, of your faithfulness had you been faithful with what God had given you. But, God gives us all sorts of different things, and uh, we often fail to handle them well. I mean, I could stand up here, um, you know, stu I could stand up here and talk about all the ways that I've failed to do this this week. Uh, I think that, that w once we start to think along these lines, we, we begin to recognize, wow, okay, so God has given me time, and I just spent three hours on Facebook. Is that a sin? Yeah. <laughs> okay, God gave me time. And it's a very important commodity. And for me to just use it in that way, uh, that's probably a mismanagement of time. Okay? Or, or God has given me some chores and instead I'm playing video games all night. Okay? Well, that's, that's a mismanagement of responsibility. There's all sorts of different things that we do. Uh, relationships. Actually, the junior high sixth grade boys came up with this. God gives us relationships. I didn't, it wasn't in my notes, but they said it, so I'm remembering it now. But relationships are also a responsibility God has given us. And how many of us have failed that responsibility with our parents, right? We're supposed to, as Christians especially, promote peace and unity. And we're supposed to be people who can, who can long suffer with other people's shortcomings. And that's our responsibility. And we fail to do that, right? But by the grace of God, He is able to transform us and rescue us right? I mean, by the grace of God, we are redeemed people. And, and this is true of any of the spiritual disciplines we talk about. Um, you know, we're going to fail to do it as, as good as we should. But God in his grace rescues us, and God in his patience changes us. And he is slowly at work in me, and he's at work in you. And, and our hope is, is that he would change us to be people who who handle our responsibilities in a way that's pleasing to him and, and who do the things that he wants us to do. Um, but, but he is very patient with us, isn't he? And, and, uh, and so we're grateful. 
So let's pray once more, and then if the Honduras team could chill for a couple more minutes. God, thanks again, and uh, thank you for these wise questions that, that provoke more discussion around these topics. Help us, God, uh, when we fall short, and we will, to quickly turn to Christ, to not be people who are self-condemned or condemned by our enemy, who is the great accuser, who would love to stand over our shoulder and go, look, you're such a loser. You are not doing what God wants you to do. And for us to just feel so defeated. But God, um, you are the God who stands before us as, an, as our advocate and says, this man is a stick who has been snatched from the fire. This man is filthy and he needs adjustment and he needs change, but I've provided that for him. And so um, that idea from Zechariah 3 that I just prayed, God, I hope that all of us could experience that, that we would not be condemned by our enemy, but that we would be upheld by our Savior. And so even when we fail to manage well, help us to trust in a Savior who perfectly managed all of the responsibilities given him and at the end of his life, he said, I have finished the work that my father has given me to do. And so we trust in that finished work in his name. Amen. Love you guys. Honduras team, can we just chill back there?